The views expressed and the opinions given by the individual host and their guests do not necessarily reflect those of Para-X, its affiliates, or its sponsors. Step outside of your comfort zone. See the world with a whole new perspective. Join us and experience the unexplained on the paranormal view. And welcome everybody right here to the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. I want to thank everyone for being with us tonight. Those in the chat room and those listening from around the world, we appreciate each and every one of you. Um, tonight, uh, we got a great guest uh, tonight. And if you do have questions, you can private chat them to either Ceiling Cat, Tabby Cat, or myself. And we will get those answered for you. And I don't see Tabby Cat in the chat room, so... You probably can't send her one either. Uh, but uh, if you're listening from somewhere else, you can come over to para-xradionetwork.com and uh, just join in the chat. So it's very easy to do. So with that, uh, tonight we have with us Barbara Duncan. Good evening, everyone. And we got Tabby Cat Gash. How you doing, everybody? And we got with us Jeffrey Gould. Uh, hello. All right. Well, because uh, there's probably going to be a lot to talk about, we're not going to, you know, just talk a whole lot here to start with. Because uh, I think uh, unless there's uh, any questions that uh, Tabby or Jeff or Barbara's got, um, I'm going to let you go ahead and introduce our guest. Okay, well, our guest tonight is Lyle Blackburn. He's a native of Texas, cryptozoologist, author, and filmmaker who has contributed significant definitive research on the Boggy Creek monster of Falk, uh, Arkansas, delivering a deeper insight into the background of southern uh, Sasquatch legends. He's the founder of the rock band Ghoul Town, which has at least nine albums in release. Lyle also narrates and was producer of documentary films on Mothman and the Boggy Creek monster. And he served both as consulting producer and special episode host on the TV series Monsters and Mysteries in America, and generally can be found speaking at various cryptozoology conferences and horror conventions, and well known for a trademark black cowboy hat. So, welcome, welcome, Lyle Blackburn. Thanks for having me. All right, no problem. None whatsoever. Glad to have you. Um, I think um, I'd like to find out exactly um, what got you. Looking for things in the swamp. What you led? What led you in that direction? Well, you know, as far back as I can remember, I loved, loved horror movies. Anything that had to do with monsters, you know, when I was little. And somewhere in there, I got a a book in elementary school that had stories of Bigfoot, Yeti, Loch Ness monster, things like that. And you know, that really grabbed my imagination because I thought, wow. You know, this this is like monsters, but these things could be out there. These could be real. And growing up in Texas, of course, all these things seem far away. You know, Loch Ness Monster in Scotland and things like that. But I had the fortune of seeing a movie called The Legend of Boggy Creek uh, when I was young in a drive-in. And that dramatized sightings of a Sasquatch-like creature in southern Arkansas, only about three hours from where I lived. So... That kind of brought it home. I thought, wow, you know, there could be things like this out here. I, you know, I grew up hunting with my father, so we spent a lot of time in the woods. And and that that kind of set me on that course for the for a lifelong fascination with the subject. And, you know, I, I re- really didn't become a, a serious a, a researcher per se until I was an adult. And then I started looking to, into these things sort of with, you know, more of an adult view and uh, ended up deciding to write a book about the legend of Boggy Creek and the Falk monster. And that book came out, the beast of Boggy Creek. And I got a great response from that. And that sort of set me on the path of, okay, this is great stuff. Let me continue this research and I, being that I'm from the South, I'm, I'm in Texas, and a lot of the places that I've visited uh, that have phenomenon, 
are in that area is that's kind of kind of why I always lean towards swampy southern areas and that's kind of prevalent in most of my books and you know because I can go to those places and I can write about them I can interview people and that's become the focus of my my research so um, you know it's just been a lot of fun uh, doing these things now have you been have you actually visited uh, Falk swamp area Oh yes, for countless times at this point. I, I was going down there prior to writing the book and going up, you know, and, and when I actively started interviewing people, kind of digging up the stories and the facts and everything from the creature sightings to the making of the movie, then I did spend significant more time, you know, going out in those the swampy sulfur river bottoms. And ever since then, I mean, I, I go back there frequently more than any other place. Um, and then, of course, I've, you know, branched out and been all over the deep south to similar places. But, it, yeah, it's it's just my favorite sort of home place as far as research. Now, what makes the, the Boggy Creek monster uh, so different from what people today just commonly know as Bigfoot because I remember seeing that movie myself when it came All out. All of the beauty that I could see and from stars and it was, from there, he would I ask guess, me all uh, these questions. Uh, Bigfoot and with an attitude. My problem. mind began to wonder of like uh, because it was, you know, pretty scary. You know, this critter going around and hurting people and everything else. But where does that? Where does the Boggy Creek monster differ from your typical Bigfoot? Or is there a difference? Well, I, I think technically there's not much difference. Um, you know, the movie definitely plays up the the scary aspect of it. And being that some of the encounters that were first made public in 1971 had to do with the creature trying to get in the home and seemingly attacking livestock and things like that, it, it automatically you know, branded that creature and, and almost branded Southern Sasquatch as having this aggressive sort of nature. But yeah. when you really kind of look at all Bigfoot reports and things, they're very similar. I mean, the creature here, it's, it is described as maybe being um, more, more aggressive, even more hairy, uh, more unkempt often said to have a foul odor, hence like a skunk ape. Uh, but, you know, you can find stories of aggressive, aggressive Bigfoots throughout, you know, in the Pacific Northwest, Ohio, er everywhere, really. There's just those cases where individuals seem to be more aggressive than others. Um, but I, I think what it boils down to is when a creature like that is seen near a small town, you know, it, it's the newspapers called it the Falk Monster, and then a movie was made, and it's the Boggy Creek Monster. It takes on sort of a personality of its own as if it's, you know, a, a very unique thing. But, you know, if you start going around, you know, the skunk ape is in Florida is called the skunk ape, and there's plenty of other uh, regional Bigfoots, the Caddo Critter, the Holly Hem you know, the, the Sharpsville monster, all these other sort of ones that have a name, but essentially they're all basically bipedal, hairy, Bigfoot-like creatures that remain unproven. Well, do you figure that the reason that some of these uh, various different versions of Bigfoot, uh, I'm using that as, you know, just a general term, Maybe the reason that they do look different is for the same reason that uh, we here in America, even though we're all Americans, it, you can go into every state and have a different accent. Heck, you can even go into the, a state and have different regional dialects. You figure that uh, the critters such as Bigfoot, it adapts to its environment, and of course in a swamp area – it's nasty, it's humid and slimy, and you probably have more of a stench about you than, say, if you were out in the, the desert area. And perhaps it's just uh, the way it's treated 
as to how it behaves because you know people do the same thing yeah that's very true and i think that is the the reason for some of the differences in the descriptions you know some of those in the pacific northwest often described as being eight feet tall or nine feet tall and they're bulky and huge when you get into a an environment that's hotter and more humid and things you know the creatures often described as being a little shorter uh, you know more ape-like the skunk ape for example is always described as being more ape-like and that doesn't mean they're not bigfoot it just means that they're yeah they're adapted to their environment and you know down here in the south you know we shoot at things and that that, <laughs> that may explain why some of these creatures are aggressive and territorial and mad and i certainly understand that and yeah, if I lived don't in, blame them <laughs> i had a fur coat and i lived in a swamp i'd be right mad too but you know that that and you know and of course it gives them the personality but i think you know there's something called bergman's law which is uh, animals that live uh, more north and colder environments are often heavier and, and bigger and mm -hmm. so all these things with the bigfoot description seem to generally match up with other laws that affect other animal species let's talk a little bit more about that scent because it fascinates me that well the skunk ape obviously got its name because of that the odor but it also seems to me that it's a like a pheromone uh, or a marking tool uh, that let that lets them be territorial to a certain degree, wouldn't you say? Absolutely, yeah. I, I think that that's something that they can probably control. You know, because you have sometimes people have a fairly close encounter, and you know they say, "I, I didn't smell anything. Shouldn't I smell anything?" It's you know, this is skunk ape territory. You know, I think it depends on whether the creature is alarmed. You know, it's not simply a, a body odor situation where they, if they're in the summer in these places, they all smell the same. It's it's more of that territorial markings. And there's so many animals that have unique uh, characteristics and abilities that they can put off you know, smells and, and, and all sorts of things to let others know that they're 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 there or to alert their own uh, you know families so yeah i think that's exactly what it is and the other side to that at least in the northern um sasquatch hunting groups they talk about um being sick to their stomach or almost like an emf kind of headache that they get um are you familiar with that and do you think it's it's sort of like a protective or some sort of thing that they can emanate uh, to to keep people away yeah I think that's very possible you, you do have those eyewitness encounters and in, in which the individuals say they you know they either sense something or they felt this nauseating feel or you know their head felt strange and you know they in some way or another connected that to the sighting of a creature so yeah i think you know we, we can't underestimate the abil abilities of uh, animals you know i mean look at things that a, an octopus can do or even a chameleon that can change colors or uh, just the heightened senses and things that uh, animals have so i think certainly that there could be something you know, that they can emanate that that would give off this sort of uh, adverse effect to not only humans but whatever else they wanted to uh, you know keep away you know, well, that, that show on TV that talked it was like a finding Bigfoot show and they had a, a <coughs> zoologist in there and um, a bunch of other people and one of them did get sick really really sick uh, and it makes me wonder if they have that ability um, and is it sort of regional, like you were talking about? Some of them emanate an odor, and some of them emanate this kind of EMF field, it seems like, right? Right. You know, it's, it's hard to, to really tell if it's, 
you know, contained to any certain region uh, or not, or or it's just different individuals or can or have or are willing to use those things. Because, you know, over time, as looking at these reports for a decade or more, you just tend to see a lot of randomness. You know, there's no one thing or one state that would have any more reports of that than say another one. So, so that, that's kind of the hard part about this is there is some inconsistency and in, in not as many patterns that could help define whether, you know, there's a group in a certain region that may have those abilities and a certain group over here that doesn't. I'm sure if you, took all the data and tried to look at every sighting, which would be thousands and thousands, you could probably find something in there, but that would take some considerable work to kind of figure out whether it is contained to a region. Do you believe that they're social creatures? I think somewhat, but I, I think there is, you know, there's definitely a solitary nature, you know, because if we, you know, take the anecdotal sightings, you know, as as given, almost always it's it's a solitary creature. So, you know, no one very rarely comes up and say they saw a family group or even two together or, you know, never like I saw a whole tribe or anything like that. So I think obviously they have to be somewhat social in order to keep their population going. But I think it's it's like a lot of other apex predators where the males primarily probably roam and go from one group to another and stay relatively solitary most of their lives. So they have their own man cave. <laughs> man cave? Well... My buddies always post pictures of their man caves that has Bigfoot stuff on the wall. So I guess a Bigfoot has a big, big cave with pictures of humans that they tricked or attacked. On the wall. So I don't know. Oh, I could just picture that. Somebody ought to make a cartoon of that one. <laughs> yeah, that would be hilarious. Like the, it has all the opposite stuff from the humans that you know correlates to what we have. <laughs> Complete with pinup yetis, you know. <laughs> yeah, look at the fur on that one. You guys ain't right. <laughs> now, you're you're talking a lot about the uh, swamp in the area that you live in in southern Louisiana, uh, or is it southern Arkansas? Well, yeah, I, I live in I live near Fort Worth, Dallas oh, area, okay. Texas, right. and then okay. so I'm I'm in a great position because if I go. Just a bit northeast, I'm there in the swampy bottoms of Arkansas, and then if I go east, I'm right there in Louisiana, and, uh, you know, there's right there, when you get to the border of Texas and Louisiana, there's a place called Caddo Lake that is just, oh, it's majestic and beautiful and spooky all at the same time. It's it's this primordial swamp-looking lake that has, you know, the cypress trees and the Spanish moss. When you get out there in a canoe, I mean, you, you literally kind of expect a dinosaur or something to just pop out of the duckweed and, you know, look at you. So those are great, great places and, and the, the places where I really love to go and, and you know, even just canoe around there late at night in the moonlight. And uh, they can be really spooky, obviously, but these are places where people have reported sightings for many many years so it, it's really good areas so how many oh. how many different swamps are they and roughly you know uh, what are their names so we can kind of keep them separated well I, there i mean there's all sorts of types of swamps whether it's uh a bog where the rain fall builds up or whether it's uh plains where rivers have overflowed or whether it's marsh-like areas that are on the coastal estuaries. Um, when I, my, my book, Sinister Swamps, I cover 
uh, larger, more notable swamps around North America that have a long history of paranormal activity, whether that's sightings of monsters, which there certainly are from Bigfoot to pterodactyls and black dogs, to uh, obviously other phenomenon. You know, when you get in a swampy area, there's ghost lights and orbs and ghosts and tales of witches, all sorts of things. In, in that book, I cover roughly about 20 different major swamps from Hockamock Swamp in Massachusetts to Honey Island Swamp in Louisiana to the Everglades to the uh, Okefenokee, which is a huge swamp in southern Georgia, uh, to Big Swamp and... Um, there's even swamps in the middle of Texas where you wouldn't expect there to be things like that. Um, Otine Swamp. Um, so there's just so many, just countless numbers. And if you, you know, it's kind of hard to put a swamp in a boundary, I guess. So um, the more I looked into those cases, because I thought, you know, swamps are cool and spooky and there's always strange phenomenon. The more I looked into it, the more I realized just how many swampy areas there are all across North America. So if you look at all those swamps and you start to figure out what is exactly are they eating in there? And what type of wildlife are you looking at in in those swamps? Are there must be something large enough for them to feed on, right? Oh, certainly. I I think swamps are the most nutrient-rich places. I mean, you have thousands of say frogs i mean when you go in there at night paddling i mean the frogs are just so loud and you can see them everywhere uh you know frogs snakes all sorts of insects Uh, obviously there's a lot of water so that gives you a lot of vegetation um you know that that could be eaten there's uh you know swamps there deer live in swamps wild hogs uh, of course, alligators, you know, I've seen countless alligators. I mean, I don't I doubt that a Bigfoot or something would, would like to tangle with that. But, um, but yeah, definitely, there's just, uh, it's just, it's really rich. And I think that is one reason that perhaps there's more sightings within those swampy areas of cryptids, because this is not only a, a place that has a lot of you know, food and water resources, but it's also a place that's usually fairly undeveloped, uh, less foot traffic. You can really get back there in remote areas that people don't go. And I think that would give them the ideal seclusion that they obviously require in order to stay unproven. Wow. Well, pretty much every state has its own swamps and mines. Yeah, I mean, every, every state, really, because, you know, people think about swamps sort of in terms of... Heck, uh, even New Jersey's got its swamps. Yeah. The south. Oh, yeah, that's what I'm saying. Where, where I grew up, we had uh, numerous swamps, but you really kind of had to be a local to know about them, because but we, you know, as we grew up, we, we learned a new one. Jeff, you're breaking up. Uh, of course, I'm breaking up. I'm trying to say something. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, yeah, you're right. I mean, a lot of these swamps. I mean, if you if you go into the place, you know, locally, you would learn about things you wouldn't know about, or you know, that aren't written about, maybe on even on the internet so much. So you know, I've concentrated obviously on ones that had a long published history of stuff and then you could find other swamps where if you know if you went somewhere and started to talk to people who live nearby they'd probably start telling you all kinds of crazy stories about what had been reported there you know like my grandfather saw this or you know there's rumored of this monster so it's just an endless amount of really cool fascinating tales and legends and and reported encounters coming out of those sorts of areas. Okay, we got a really great question in the chat room, and one that's very timely right now. And and she's asking, and I want to know this too: is 
where do these creatures go for shelter during major natural events like hurricanes or in California, now we have forest fires. Um, we're starting to see bears encroach into habit, uh, habited areas now. Uh, but where do these creatures go? Well, that's a great question. And, and you would expect that when we do have things like flooding or fires that perhaps that would be suddenly there'd be more sightings of them because they're having to flee their usual habitat. Um, but I mean, essentially, I guess they do what other creatures, you know, they have to, you know, move out of the area. Um, you know, of course, you know, climb trees, whatever, whatever it takes. Um, I, I think the key here is there are just so many less cryptids or the population of, of the, of a Sasquatch is so small compared to those of bears that they're still very hard to see, even if there's a natural disaster. Um, you know, you may, oh, all of a sudden we see some bears, but you got to remember there could be 25,000 bears in some of the Northern states where there could be a viable population of Bigfoots, you know, 250 or 300 individuals. So I think it's still going to be hard to see them. And, uh, you know, they just would do what any other wildlife would do is leave the area or find high ground or whatever they had to do or, or perish. That's, that's another sad part about it is they, we may, those, those forest fires and things, we might've lost, you know, a significant amount of Bigfoots, you know? Wow. Yeah, Very that's true. sad. So, how many of the different swamps have you actually been to, and uh, what are the different types of uh, swamp creatures that they're supposed to be? I know you got Lizard Man and uh, the Beast of Boggy Creek. Are, are those pretty much the same or is are they different those are different uh the lizard man is said to be a bipedal uh reptilian type humanoid you know it's it's anthropomorphic which looks human-like yet it's covered in brown or green sort of scaly skin and uh one of my books, Lizard Man, I discussed the history of a creature called the Bishop Bill Lizard Man near a place called Skatepore Swamp in South Carolina. And so that, to me, was definitely something described differently than Bigfoot. And to me, it was like a creature from the Black Lagoon type of a case in modern day times, you know, very fascinating. Um, and... You know, so when I wrote that book, I went out there to South Carolina and spent some time there in that little town of Bishopville and interviewed key witnesses and and the sheriff who had uh, looked into that case back in 1988. And um, from there, I've I've been to numerous other swamps. I mean, in my book, you know, I'd I'd been to about maybe 15 of those all all around that I talk about. And had you know, literally canoed in there, or interviewed people, or or whatever, at some time or another. And uh, you know, you get reports of pretty much everything. You know, there was uh, there's a, a Hockamock Swamp in Massachusetts. There was a lot of documented newspaper accounts of people seeing what they described as pterodactyls, like pterosaur, flying, leathery, skinned. Uh, flying creatures, you know, in and around that swamp, um, sort of in a flap. And then I interviewed a guy who saw this huge dog-like creature run across the road one night when he was coming uh, through there from his, he was a prison guard and drove at night. He saw this huge sort of uncanny, creepy dog run in front of him. Uh, then, of course, Bigfoot sightings. Um, there's an area that I covered in Georgia in, in the Altamaha River area 
that the Altamaha River basically runs into a swampy area as it gets towards the, the coast. And within that, there's a creature called the Altamaha Ha, which is, for lack of a better term, sort of a Loch Ness monster, sort of a creature, a serpent-like thing that has been seen down there for decades uh, in the river and in the swampy areas around that. So, you know, you've got the river monster types. Um, you've got puckwudgies, which are sort of small goblin-like creatures that are said to inhabit swamps. Um, you have, there was uh, what's called black dogs, sort of hellhound-looking things. There is strange uh, sightings of black panthers. I got that in several of the swamps. So you really just know in to the sort of categories of cryptids that would be reported in in one or more uh, of the swampy areas that I looked into. Hmm. Uh, Lila, have you ever heard of, I know this sounds kind of strange, but uh, have you ever heard of the United States FBI having a file on Bigfoot? Well, I mean, you know, that's obviously one thing that's been debated over the years about Bigfoot, because we know, of course, they've looked into phenomenon like UFOs, and conceivably, you know, I'm sure that at some time or another, some government agency has surely tried to look into this, and probably more early on, back in, you know, in the late 60s, when the Patterson-Gimlin film came out, and things like that, I guarantee you, they wanted to know more about that, and probably did, so I suspect that they do have some files or something somewhere which noted whatever they, you know, concluded about it. Now, the you know, that goes into the theory of, well, the, some say that the government knows all about Sasquatch and they're not telling us. I honestly don't think they know any more than we do um, because, you know, they, well, they haven't done anything with that information conceivably that the government doesn't do things very well and is totally inefficient. So if, <laughs> if, if these hunter friends of mine in Texas can't get a good, uh, you know, picture of Bigfoot and other things, then I doubt the government could do better than them. And I, I know some really, really good hunters and some guys, especially in an area called the Washita Mountains that span from eastern Oklahoma to western Arkansas, uh, some associates of mine have spent years up there with camera traps and just really intensely researching this area that has a lot of sightings. And some of these guys are military trained, there's biologists, very, um, very skilled and knowledgeable guys. And while they've come up with a lot of anecdotal sightings and field reports and audio and rock throwing events, they still have been unable to really capture that either ultimate photo or a, a body or anything else to, to ultimately prove it. So I think it's something that we can't prove, neither can the government. Yeah. Well, there's an awful lot of uh, people that believe that there's a connection or a correlation between Bigfoot and UFO sightings. And I, you know, to me personally, I think that's just a little bit far fetched. But uh, when you think about it, if the FBI did have a file or does have a, have a file on Bigfoot, it's probably somewhere in between the pages of the UFO sightings. I mean, the, the government still is trying to claim, oh, well, you know, our research department, you know, uh, such as uh, Project Blue Book, it doesn't exist anymore, which I don't believe. It just has another name. But um, if Bigfoot does have any kind of connection with UFOs, it would fall under that category of um, the government looking at Bigfoot, as <laughs> sounds strange, as being a uh, national security risk. 
because they consider UFOs to be that. So, yeah, it would make a certain amount of sense. I mean, the, the government has done strange things before, so why not? <laughs> right, and, and if you kind of look at the golden age of this stuff in the 1970s, all of those phenomenons were interconnected. And early on, you had UFO researchers that would look into Bigfoot things. You, you didn't have a lot of cryptozoologists or Bigfoot hunters, uh, you know. So they they were you know a lot of the books that were written back then just covered all sorts of crazy stuff, all in you know all the paranormal phenomenon in one you know chunk. And and I think probably the government at those early times probably looked at it like you say in exactly the same way or it's like well uh, is all this stuff connected you know why are why are people reporting ufos or bigfoots or whatever uh, although you know in my opinion I, I don't think they have anything to do with each other because you know i've i've interviewed hundreds and hundreds of bigfoot eyewitnesses and none of them say, well, I saw a UFO and then I saw a Bigfoot. It's yeah. far more rare in, in which there's some UFO phenomenon that could be connected to a creature. Now, certainly, there is times where those correspond or, or are seen in the same vicinity, but that doesn't mean the Bigfoot got off of the craft. And big, the Bigfoot, just the persona and the image of it is so much... It's so manlike. It's it's like the apes we have here. It's like great apes. It's so so terrestrial that to me it's something that is closer related to us on this earth than it is, you know, aliens coming from another planet that probably look nothing like we even perceive them to look. That you know, to me, that Bigfoot is just so much a it's so manlike, you know. Yeah. Now, have you had any of your own personal experiences with something that you really couldn't explain? Yeah, I've, I've had a few. Um, you know, to start, ironically, I've seen a ghost, which I saw something when I was a senior in high school. And just, just to make that a short story, it, a friend of mine uh, lived in a house, and he had claimed to see a ghost of a boy in the house, and his parents had seen it, and even several of my friends said they had seen this. And, uh, you know, it was just something that they talked about. I didn't think too much of it, but one evening I was sitting there in his living room, and just out of the corner of my, my eye, I saw this whitish figure about the size of a boy walk across this hallway. And I just, you know, I turned my head and looked, and it was very quick, but it's like, wow, I just saw, I guess, the ghost. And, you know, that kind of got me, you know, I was interested in ghosts and all this stuff early on, so that was really cool and it was exciting. Um, as, as someone who's, you know, been studying cryptids and so forth, um, I have not definitively seen something that I would say is a Bigfoot. However, there have been something vague that I saw once and also something that has just eluded me and something that howled at uh, myself and another researcher once. Um, and, and to be short about those, um, once in Boggy Creek, area we were paddling the swamps at midnight and we heard this strange howl um at first we thought ah is that, is that the weirdest coyote you ever heard of what and then it howled a second and a third time and at that point we realized i can't identify that i don't know what that is and mm. then myself my partner very experienced in hunting and outdoors and you know, there's a lot of noises that can be made from birds. Even foxes made weird, make weird noises. Obviously, coyotes and things. We couldn't identify it, uh, but it, it stopped. And then we ended up paddling back down to where our camp was. And when we got out, pulled the canoe up, and went up this kind of hill area where our tent was, all of a sudden, 
we hear that same howl right down there where we had pulled the canoe out, just right across the water channel. And I was like, whoa. And I grabbed the flashlight and ran down that hill trying to see what it was. But, uh, of course, whatever it was quickly moved off. And then I heard the howl again, probably 50 yards away. And then it was gone. But, you know, I can't say that that was the Falk monster or a Bigfoot, but it, it was definitely big, strange, and presumably it followed us down the, the waterway there. Those mm, howls that's scary. are amazing, you know. Um, and it, talk about communication a little bit because I find it fascinating. Uh, everybody has these recordings and also of the howls, but also the knocks. Has anybody sat down and started to analyze the series of knocks and what they could possibly mean? Uh, are they are they vocalizations of a speech of some sort or uh, of communication? Do you think? Uh, and if so, is there sort of a repertoire that they have to say like two knocks, then three knocks, then one means get out? <laughs> yeah, I mean that's. That's a good question, and, and certainly one that's been looked into as far as trying to understand that if those knocks are coming from Bigfoots, what is it they're trying to convey? Uh, now, as far as the audio vocals, the howls and things, there, there are some guys that will take those and analyze those and compare them to others and have files and sound waves um, in which they evaluate those howls as being from something we can't identify. The wood knocks, and you do get recordings of wood knocks, there's, I don't really know of a study where they've had enough, enough of those to really start analyzing as if it's sort of a Morse code or something that they're using. It's usually just a knock or two, and that's about all you get. Sometimes if you knock, whatever it is will knock back. But much like most of Bigfoot, there's just not enough data or files or uniform, uniform uh, collaboration to try to even decode any of this. And, you know, at best, we just can theorize that if that's Bigfoot making those knocks, Obviously, they're communicating in some way, whether that's between themselves or a warning to humans. I think probably communicating among themselves. They don't really need to warn us, I wouldn't think. It's just something that if they want to remain elusive, maybe they, you know, they, they use the knocks. So, but again, I was rarely, if any, ever have somebody saying they actually saw Bigfoot making the knock. You just got strange knocks coming out of the woods with, with no real definitive evidence to say even what's making those knocks. You know, so that's, that's a hard puzzle to solve. Uh, you got to figure that Bigfoot, are, whether it, it is actually an offshoot or a cousin to uh, humans, or if it's another uh, animal species altogether, they still have the same instincts that all animals do, even we do, when something is near and we feel threatened or we feel uh, endangered in some way, then your first reaction is one of two things, fight or flight. And a Bigfoot, being so much larger than a human, they're not going to confront a human unless it's absolutely necessary because they don't know what they're up against, first of all. So, in my opinion, most Bigfoot would be more likely to avoid you, and if they are close by, it's just simply to wonder what you're doing in their territory. They're not going to confront you. They're going to stay away, and let's face it, human beings in the woods, uh, unless you're extremely stealthy, we make a heck of a lot of noise when we're in the woods. You know, we're stomping around, we're talking, we're, you know, laughing and that sort of thing. Bigfoot can hear us a mile away, like most other animals have acute hearing. And 
they're not going to come any closer than they absolutely have to. So those sightings where people uh, camp out in the woods at night and they hear something stomping around their campsite, they get up the next morning and something's, you know, torn up or knocked over. Most likely it's probably a bear or something like that. But if it is a Bigfoot, they're just coming around to see if maybe they're, they couldn't get a free lunch, just like a bear would. Or they're sizing us up for dinner. <laughs> yeah, looking to see. Yeah, we, we don't we don't know up. we don't know the psychology of a of a Bigfoot yet, and I'd hate to to anthropomorphize um, uh, something that we don't know anything about yet. <laughs> so, no, but you know it it it's fascinating because, and Lyle, you maybe you can address this some of the shows that are on television right now. How much of the of it's true and how much of it's just sensationalism. But some of it does talk of Bigfoots in packs and chasing people and uh, very aggressive. And do you think that that's uh, more common now or is it, is it a, an aggressive behavior because humans are encroaching into their area more? I, I don't think it's necessarily more common. And you know, you got to be careful which TV shows you're deriving information from because some of those more sensational ones if you will uh, are the least credible uh, it's TV and, and as well it, not to say that the researchers themselves aren't credible it's you're at the mercy of a production company network who, who does the final editing of those things and implies what they want to imply so it doesn't matter what intentions and you may have, but you know, basically, um, I think ultimately these creatures would be like any others. If certain individuals were more um, aggressive or ornery or felt threatened, then they would be aggressive, um, and certain ones may be more calm. So, you know, I think. Uh, I think that uh, some of those shows amp up the the craziness of it, while in reality, there's not that many Bigfoot attacks. They do occur, and they're spread out across vast territories and over vast periods of times when the majority of Bigfoot sightings are simply, oh my gosh, what did, what did we just see run across the road? That That's the majority, but... You know, a television show. They need a, they need action and they need to move forward. They they got to make wood knocks. They need to make howls. They got to you know they got to say, well, I think it's a bunch of bigfoots after us. You know, so you know, I I I don't think that bigfoots are basically any different now than they ever have been. Oh yeah, and you get the red glowing eye stories and what have you, and. I think most hunters can probably tell you, you can probably tell the creature by the glow of the eyes, right? Yeah, I mean, most most experienced hunters, especially if you're like a coon hunter or something that goes out after dark, can usually identify. I can, I can spot a possum or a raccoon easily if I see those, the eye shine. Um, but, you know, there's those times where... They see something that the eyes are a little further apart than you're used to, and it implies that it's a much larger creature. And if it's not, you know, an owl or something reflecting your your uh, flashlight, then who knows what it is? And of course, you know, the the red glowing eyes is something that you know it strikes a spooky fear in everybody. So, you know, those are those are something that. Do, that does get reported with Bigfoot sightings. Yeah. yeah, I think some of that stems from the fact we – remember the old cameras used to have the red glow uh, in the eyes when you, every time you snapped a flash photo? Right. That's kind of what it <laughs> – <laughs> yeah. I think a lot of it tends to be um, is, is superstition. And so how do you go about um, looking at these stories and saying, well – this is probably folklore and legend, and this one's probably based in a little bit more reality. Well, you know, I, I think after a while, the more you 
interview people, especially interview people firsthand, then you start to get a good sense about which things are more um, probable to have been a possible unknown creature and which things are just sort of either wishful thinking or mistaken identities and things. And certainly, uh, you know, there's a range of it. And it, it's always great when I research an area and find some old newspaper articles and establishing a long history of these things. But certainly you have to say, well, it's a it's possible that without having interviewed the person myself, that that person was maybe not familiar with the woods as somebody else or, you know, may not have been aware that a bear was in the area. So you know, the best thing for me is when possible, if I can interview a witness firsthand, meet that person and really get a sense of, you know, whether they could discern the difference between Bigfoot and other things, then, you know, those are the ones that you could say, well, okay, there's something to this. And and that's really what keeps me there. I don't, I'm not going to say, I wouldn't say that, you know, I, I, just believe every Bigfoot account that I ever heard here. That's just, that's not realistic, but there's those ones where you interview somebody and you may get to know this person. In a few cases, I've gotten to know them. I got to know their family. Um, the circumstances of the case, for example, uh, one where two sisters in Florida were driving uh, north from the coast in mid afternoon and saw this upright, hair-covered creature just basically stride right across the road in front of them in full daylight. And I interviewed both these women. I met them, and I, I can guarantee you they're not lying. And they didn't they didn't believe it was a person in a costume. And the, where they saw it, you kind of rounded a corner, and that's where it was. It would not have been a good place to run across the road because you, you could very well be hit by the car. If you were a human trying to trick people, for example, uh, you know, these girls absolutely saw that. And it was daylight, no mistake. And it's those kind of encounters that keep me on the track saying, OK, I can't explain that. There is something to this because these two individuals saw it. And there's others like that where I'm like, the this person absolutely saw something that I can't explain, and and those kind of keep you on. the The ones that you feel are legend or folklore and other thing are are great too because they, you know, it's it's great for the story and fascinating that people see these things. But there's the key ones that keep you on the track. So you, you said <laughs> a, if you uh, sent me out in the woods, um, I would probably not be able to tell the difference between uh, an ET and a, a, a Bigfoot either. Um, it's it's <laughs> so with the problem I guess it comes down to are you finding like we do in the paranormal field there's an awful lot of first time or uh, neophyte um, hunters out there that simply just don't know what they're doing and are, are getting all confused by what they're actually seeing I mean you know that could be, you know, I never want to imply that I'm an expert in this because people, you know, say, oh, well, in, in newspapers will interview me. And then there's a story that says Bigfoot expert says this. Like, I never call myself an expert. <laughs> you know, all of us are basically, um, you know, just doing our best um, and can't prove anything than anybody else. But certainly when you're talking about experience in the woods and familiarity with different animals and different circumstances in the day and the night, you know, I'm, I might think if someone who's been hunting for 25 years tells me about an experience and usually they're like, I never believed in Bigfoot. I thought it was, you know, nonsense, but then I was in the woods and well, this person I, I'm thinking, okay, they're probably not mistaking something else because they are very familiar. Whereas if I get a report, the first time I went camping, I've never been out of the city and I went camping and we saw a Bigfoot. I, you know, they may have very well saw a Bigfoot. Yes. 
but I probably wouldn't stake my life on that one. I would put it on what I would consider somebody familiar with the, uh, you know, the, the, the woods and, and everything else. So, you know, every encounter, depending on the person, is going to stack up different as far as the credibility meter. Um, but I do think that people are legit. They see stuff and, they, you know, they, they, they're not making it up. I mean, certainly you do have those cases, but in most, most circumstances, they just, man, I saw this. I think it was a Bigfoot. Wow. See, that would be me. I'm a glamper. Um, <laughs> just, I will shut the camper door and, you know, open a bottle of Chardonnay. That's <laughs> yeah, so, I can encounter ghosts, but I, I, I really don't necessarily one come face to face with a Bigfoot. I really don't. I'm only five foot one, so something like that would be seriously intimidating to me. No, nope, no. Nope. Go uh, go and close the door. So you say and, and I think that's what another thing is, you know, a lot of people come up, you know, nonchalant, oh yeah, I saw a Bigfoot, it looked in my truck window. In reality, I mean you just like you're thinking if could you imagine seeing something, a seven-foot-tall, hairy, rough-looking, powerful-looking thing you've never seen? Like, just think about a gorilla you've seen in the zoo, but this thing is standing upright. It would be far more scary and traumatizing, I think. Yep. There wouldn't be any sort of like, oh, well, you know, yeah, I saw that. It would it would shake you up, and, and I that's another thing. When I interview a witness and they they are shaken up, even when they're retelling the story, and that's happened many times where they are literally upset. That's the reaction I feel like is legitimate because if you saw something like that, it would be flipping your world upside down, you know. Yeah. So you say these two women was going north uh, on the coastal highway in Florida? Yes, they were, I want to say they were near a town called Cedar Key. That, I may be wrong about that. It's been a minute since I looked at that one. But they had been on a cruise, and they were coming, you know, they docked that morning, and they got in their car, and they were they were driving. I, I don't remember where they lived at the time. The, the, one of the girls was moved all over, so, but... Uh, they were driving, and they were going through a is a very heavily wooded area. And in that region, there has been a history of Bigfoot reports. They were just driving, and all of a sudden, they kind of rounded that corner, and this thing just boom right across the road, wow. and then ran into the woods. Well, they, like I was just saying, they they immediately just freaked out, and they had the wherewithal to turn around. They did a U turn. And they turned on their phone and were ready in case they saw it again. But you can hear their, you can hear them talking about it, and they're, as they're filming, you know, the wood line as they're going back and looking. And you can tell that this is no act. These these two two ladies were freaked out, and they, uh, unfortunately, they didn't see the creature again. And I even actually went frame by frame to look and see if I could see it in those woods, maybe looking out, but I didn't see it. But uh, you don't often have two witnesses. Usually it's one person saying they saw a Bigfoot. This is two people, broad daylight, and we're fairly confident that it was an animal, not a person, that ran across the road. So that uh, – and, and again, I've gotten that – one of the girls got very much into Bigfoot because of that, because she was almost wanting to figure out what is it I saw. I want to know more. So she started coming to different conferences, and I've seen her many, many times over the last five or six years since then. And I still believe these are stand-up witnesses. Her and her sister are just some of the best I have ever encountered. And and if if only these two girls saw Bigfoot, then that's enough to say they exist. Wow. All right. It's time for us to take a break and let's see uh, who usually takes us out. Well, well after about Jeff. two years, I think me. Okay, then, Jeff, why don't you take us out for break and 
Uh, we'll be back in about uh, seven, eight minutes. So, Jeff? Yep. You're listening to The Paranormal View on para-x.com with hosts Henry Foister, Ceiling Cab Barbara Duncan, Tabby Cat Gash, and myself, Jeffrey Goulds, with our guest cryptozoologist, Lyle Blackburn. So stay tuned for more of The Paranormal View after the break. Whether you're listening at home, at work, or anywhere, thanks for making Para-X part of your day. Your source for everything paranormal, Para-X. And welcome back, everybody, right here to the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. I want to thank everyone for being with us tonight, those here in the chat room and those listening from around the world. We appreciate each and every one. Remember, if you got questions uh, of our guests, you can private chat them to either Ceiling Cat, Tabby Cat, or myself, Henry Foister, and we will get those answered for you. So with that, uh, we have uh, with us Barbara Duncan. Hello, everyone. And we have Tabby Cat Gash. Hi, everybody. And we have Jeffrey Gould. Hello. All right, and... Who's introducing our guest then? Oh, we, we have. have <laughs> just, one, just one of you, that's all. Just Jeff does that all stuff. It. Jeez. <laughs> Jeff guess, always does I that stuff. Do it, do it uh, Jeff. Yeah, uh, it's Lyle Blackburn, a great cryptozoologist and one of our, so far one of our better guests. <laughs> yes. I uh, want to welcome you back, uh, Lyle. Thank you. You probably say that to all the guests. I'm oh, sure. no. Not all of them. <laughs> <laughs> You'd be surprised some of the ones we've had over the years. <laughs> and sorry to say this, Henry, but he has the best looking cowboy hat. Oh, yeah. That we've ever yeah had he does, <laughs> definitely. How, how often do you have you ever had a chance to meet the Booth brothers? The three of you together would be a heck of a photo shoot. <laughs> uh, no, I haven't, but yes, that would make a great photo. Wow. Well, you know, wait, I saw one of them. I did see one at, uh, what was that, Scarefest or something, but right. it, it was very briefly. But, yeah, yeah. They, they have they, they dress really cool. They got the whole deal, too. Scarefest yeah, is in Lexington. I've been there, I don't know, three or four times. So. Yeah, that's the one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then uh, mid, Mid-South is over in Louisville. So. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, uh, of all these different sightings and creatures, because I know you talk about the lizard man and uh, the senator, uh, the the boogie, uh, the beast of Boggy Creek. So, what is the difference between these different characters? Well, you know, there, there's, I guess, several main categories of cryptids. Um, you know, Bigfoot being kind of the foremost and the one that I consider to be the most prob- probable to be proven. Within that, you have a lot of just regional names for those creatures, like Boggy Creek Monster, um, you know, in, in the Ohio Grassman the Missouri monster, Momo, things like that. But essentially they're all just described as, you know, ape-like, man-like, bipedal creatures. Then you you have things like the lizard man, which is more of a reptilian humanoid sort of thing, not to be confused with alligator people, which sort of there's some legends in Florida of something that's a little bit more alligator-like than than – humanoid i guess um there's dog men which are basically quote unquote werewolf like creatures canid large canids that can walk upright on two legs We've gotten a lot of reports it seems like a rash of reports of of dog men lately that, that can come from really anywhere there was a concentration in wisconsin back in the mid 80s that kind of ramped up to become the focal point, but I've had plenty of people say they've seen dogmen 
things in in Texas and Louisiana and other places. Um, you know, then you have the river monsters, which are aquatic sort of beasts. You know, from serpent-like to snake-like. You know, sometimes described as being Loch Ness monster, so to speak. But usually, there's other the White River monster, the Altamaha river monster that, are, that I talked about earlier. Um, there, there's ones like that. Uh, of course, the chupacabra, I get asked about a lot because I'm in Texas and there's these mangy four legged canid dog looking creatures, coyote things that, um, are called chupacabras, even though it's a confusing term because chupacabra was originally applied to a cryptid seen in the Puerto Rico and Latin American countries back in the mid nineties. And then the, the U S media, uh, took that name and gave it to these four legged creatures. You see, I'm sure people have seen the dash ca- dash cam video on some of these shows where it shows that weird looking dog running in front of the cop. Um, you know, and these are things that are out there and kind of still remain to, to be certain what they are. Um, those are your main cryptids, I, su- I suppose. And then within that, you have things like Black Panthers, which people report quite a bit, seeing these huge black felines. And when they say panther, that's the same, basically a local colloquial term for cougar or mountain lion, of which there is no, never been a proven case where they are melanistic. They're not supposed to be black. You do have black jaguars and black leopards, melanistic jaguars. Um, so when people say they saw a black panther, that is an unproven animal. So that falls into cryptozoology as well. And then sightings of both thunderbirds or feathered giant huge flying birds as well as pterosaurs which people describe as being leathery skinned basically like a pterodactyl you know it's something from the age of the dinosaurs and you know we, we i've investigated those kind of sightings i mean some people in oklahoma two pairs of witnesses say they saw what looked like a pterodactyl fly over this area near Oklahoma City. And I, there again, those people were not making this up. And both sets of witnesses did not know each other. And they reported this thing within the same time period, one of them having seen it very up close in the windshield of their truck. And so, you know, you just get reports of these wild and crazy cryptids of all sorts of categories. Mm. Uh, Lyle, we've got a question from the the chat room. Uh, Black Cat Sharon was uh, she just recently tuned in. She wanted to know from you about the various different uh, colors of fur and the size differences in the Bigfoot. And I know that they have reported anything from black to uh, red and all kinds kinds of other colors uh what are they do you think there's a variation uh, especially based on where they come from i think there is i mean judging from the sighting reports and you know the most prevalent reports are of a dark brown to black color hair on the creatures but you do get some people saying that it was blondish or auburn red in color and even white There's a famous case from where I live called the Lake Worth Monster where people reported this hairy, white sort of Bigfoot. Um, I was in Falk, Arkansas about a month or two ago, and uh, someone there that I met reported seeing this ape-like creature that ran across the road in front of his car, and he said it looked to be the color of an orangutan. So it's that, and he actually shortly thereafter, I was out in the woods in that area, and I saw something that was reddish. Uh, I saw a shadow that caught my eye, which I looked over, thinking, "What did I just see?" 
And then I saw this red looking thing, probably about 120 yards, move very fluidly across diagonally between these trees. I don't know what that was, but it was very odd that somebody had told me they saw what they said looked like an orangutan. So the point here being that I think like people, their hair color can vary. And of course, perhaps as they get older, they either, you know, they, they get darker or turn gray or, you know, the hair could change colors as they go. So it, the inconsistencies in the hair colors don't necessarily imply that this is not a real phenomenon. It just simply says that they could be very much like us. Yeah. So why do you think that there is, from what I understand, uh, no one has ever reported finding uh, a body of one of these creatures or where they might have uh, been buried in a grave or something? Well, you know, the, that, that obviously is a problem. But there again doesn't necessarily say that they don't exist. But, um, you know, the best thing we can say is that with the very realistically the very few numbers of the population of these creatures it is extremely hard to find a dead one because i mean you go back to the the old adage of how many times have you run across a dead bear which is yeah. quite true most even my 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 father's hunted for years and people I know have hunted East Texas where bears occasionally black bears do go. And, you know, if I just say, have you ever seen a bear? You ever seen a dead bear? You ever seen a track? Most of them are like, I think I saw a track once, you know, never seen a dead one. Again, bears population, the bear population quite far exceeds those of, of what Bigfoot would require to be a viable population. So I think maybe it's luck or, I mean, it's not to say that somebody hasn't come across the bones. I had a guy who had a really weird case um, of a guy who said back in the 1970s, he was down in the Trinity, Trinity River bottom, bottom south of Dallas, and it was pretty wooded back then. He said his dog came up from the river, and in his mouth he had a leg, which was from the knee portion down all the way, had the foot. It was these bones covered with some hair of this huge, he said this wasn't a human. This looked kind of like a human bone, but it was huge. He said, I never thought about it until many years later, till I saw Bigfoot shows, that I thought, well, maybe it was a Bigfoot bone. So, uh, of course, he had called the cops or something, and they came out and just, I don't know, and he never knew what happened to it. You know, it got out of his hands. But, again, he may have found legitimate bones of a Bigfoot, but, you know, now they're lost. And uh, it's not to say that some hunters haven't passed by and thought, eh, there's a femur of a cow, you know, and just walked on by. So, yeah. There could have been bones found or pieces of, of a dead Bigfoot, but if you didn't know what you were looking for or weren't specifically thinking, oh, I just jackpot, I found, you know, if you didn't find the head or something, then then that would explain why we don't have bones, I guess. I'm often curious as to, uh, you know, watching all these television shows, you see the people making plaster casts of footprints. And, of course, they refer to them as a Bigfoot footprint because of how huge they are. It always tickles me to no end that when people on these shows find what they claim is a would have to have been a Bigfoot uh, print because of its size, there always only seems to be one of them. What, a Bigfoot only hop around on one foot? I, I just find that so interesting that rather than finding, you know, like three or four of them along a riverbed or uh, on a slightly muddy side road or something, that they only manage to find one good one. That, that tickles me. It really does. In, you're right. In, in most cases, that is. 
Yes. However, there is there there are a lot of cases where a trackway was found, and there could be. Um, I mean, there may be only three, but there there could be twenty. And I've had people who had a cast and say, I, I cast this. And then I'll say, well, were there more? Well, yeah, this is the best one. So I cast this one, you know. Mm. Now, of course, I would have taken thorough pictures and, uh, and, and you know, whatever, and cast all of them. But a lot of people don't have the wherewithal. So... You're right. Most of most of the time, it's this odd one track, and you know. But it, it's harder to find tracks than you think. I mean, if you're in the woods, most of the leaf litter and things like that don't leave good tracks. And then if they stepped in the one spot where there was a dirt or mud, then maybe there was the track. And then they got back up on the leaves, nothing to be seen. So they'd really have to walk along you know, the edge of a river or something where there was a good strip of mud to leave a lot of them. So. Now, Lyle, I wanted to get your take on what I see is a, like a, seems to be a new um, approach to uh, finding Bigfoot, which is the taking DNA samples from the water uh, and trying to discover uh, what animals are drinking from it, uh, urinating in it, etc. Um, and do you think that that's probably going to be a good breakthrough for for finding some of these cryptids? Yeah, I, I think that might become something that would be useful. I mean, obviously, the, as we progress with better and better DNA technology and able to you know, discern what has passed across certain parts of the land that this is ideal for cryptid hunting because you rarely see the creatures, but certainly they have to have, if they exist, they would have have to drink out of that water or whatever they're doing. Or if we have an area where people say they have seen a lot of them, or if you find a footprint, you could actually take some of that soil and possibly get a, some DNA out of it. So I think, yeah, it's, you know, those things become better it, it's helpful of course usually it's a problem of money i mean you know it's mm -hmm. the people who are taking those surveys are not out there using that to look for bigfoot they're doing other kinds of you know more immediate research or whatever they're doing whereas if you came up with a sample of water to somebody and said hey can you test this for bigfoot <laughs> You know, they're either not going to do it, or they're going to say, "Sure, that's twenty thousand bucks, no problem." You know, like, so yeah. that's the stumbling block. Usually, is the technology is expensive, at least at first. Well, to test yeah. something like that, wouldn't you have to have a a real sample to go by to so you could clarify it? Yes, if you don't have a type specimen, the best you're ever going to do is say, "Well, there's some DNA in here that we can't identify." And, you know, perhaps it, I mean, we're, we're what, one chromosome off from a chimpanzee, so it, it would be mm -hmm. very close to great apes, but but not. And, and that's, there's cases of hair samples that are like that, where the best you can do is say, well, it doesn't match any of the local flora and, uh, I mean, the local uh, fauna, and, but... You don't have a Bigfoot hair or Bigfoot DNA on file, well, you can't. That's not going to prove it. Only give you a clue that maybe something strange is there. Yeah. Well, any any scientific research has to have a control first. Yeah. And so if you don't have something at least uh, to compare with, how are you going to know if it's a Bigfoot or if it isn't just uh, a degraded sample or a contaminated sample or something like that? So I guess until they DNA testing gets a lot more far advanced, uh, it's still kind of a hit and miss as to whether or not they're going to find anything. Right. I mean, I think ultimately without a body at this point, 
it's just nobody's going to accept anything short of that as proof. I mean, you know, I, I don't care if it's a very clear picture. Somebody will, you know, will say it's, well, that's hoax. You know, I mean, the CGI capabilities we have and Photoshop and everything else is so yeah. advanced that, you know, even the DNA thing, without that sample. So I think if Bigfoot or any of these other cryptids are to be proved, we're going to need bodies. That doesn't mean I'm advocating to go kill one. I'm just saying that's the reality of proving these at this point, probably. Sure. Uh, before it gets too late, I Has really any, want to uh, ask you about this. And that is, um, you were an executive producer on a documentary called uh, The Mothman of Point Pleasant. And I'm curious as to what conclusions you're coming to as to whether or not Mothman is a cryptid or is it something more supernatural? Well, yeah, the Mothman case is fairly unique because it does kind of encompass so many of the different paranormal categories from you know from cryptid to ufo phenomenon to the whole men in black thing that was going on in point pleasant back when those original sightings were taking place in 1966 since 1967 the cryptid sort of uh angle of that is that yeah i i know those people those witnesses saw something that at least Many of them saw something that, you know, was was there, and they saw it, and it could not identify it, and it can't be explained away as oh, it was a, a crane or an owl or what have you. Um, but then, as you progress with all the other witness reports that tell tell of Mothman sightings that were more uh, bizarre in nature that you begin to wonder whether that was sort of a, was indeed a cryptid or a physical animal or if it was some other type of phenomenon. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm open-minded to whatever, really. Um, so I don't have a, a great answer as to what the Mothman is other than to say there was a very, very strange phenomenon going on in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, starting in 1966, if perhaps not sooner, of, of this winged entity that a no, quite a number of people saw in, in conjunction with other strange phenomena. So I, I don't have any sort of one theory for it. It, it could more so be a combination where people did see some sort of a strange bird or an out-of-place creature that was of huge proportions and then other people saw other things and they were all then linked together because they had been seen in one spot so it could be a combination of things really that built up the whole Mothman legend. So uh, John Keel's uh, correlation with it being um, a harbinger of some sort of um, accidents or crises that are going to happen uh, are I don't know how much you studied them, but is it possible that, that there is a correlation? Well, I mean, possible because, you know, there in December of 1967, the Silver Bridge, which spans from the little town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia, over to Ohio, collapsed and 46 people died in that river. And that pretty much put an end to the Mothman thing you know people didn't want to hear about the mothman anymore after this tragedy well of course you know obviously then you could look at the mothman as if it was some harbinger of doom that it was being seen or was there as either a warning or whatever an omen that there was going to be this terrible tragedy and you know of course there's rumors that Someone saw the Mothman on the bridge just before it collapsed, but that, that's kind of hearsay. But 
there has always been the harbingers of doom, you know, range from all sorts of entities, but certainly the sort of winged humanoid seems to fit very well with our, you know, with, you know, with folklore and with legacies of these kind of harbingers. So I don't know that that's another thing that just really makes it an amazing case because, uh, you know, and especially great that John Hill was there to document that and put forward all these theories. So again, I, I think if it wasn't a harbinger of doom, it sure was there at the right time, you know. I you was know, unaware I of the MIB correlation with that. Oh yeah, there was. Um, so there was a, a woman named Mary Heyer that wrote a column in a local newspaper, and she began to write a lot about the Mothman sightings. And according to her, some men came into her office one day, and they were dressed these generic looking government officials or whatever they were, and told her to to you know stop don't don't look into this anymore don't write about it and it shook her up pretty bad and other people in the town had said they had seen these you know nameless sort of guys dressed in suits wandering around right around the time when the mothman was at the the high point of the sightings and the whole deal so yeah that was a whole thing going on there too doesn't that sometimes create sort of a Streisand effect if the men in black show up and say, don't look into this? You're like, well, clearly yeah. it's something to look into then. Yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, yeah they the tell opposite. me that. I'm like, I know I'm on to something good. I'm, I'm, it's like your parents <laughs> telling you, don't go over there. Don't go into them woods. Where are you yeah. going? Going in the woods. You know, I've always looked at the Mothman, believe it or not, as almost a gargoyle. Every time I see different pictures of it down through the ages and everything, it just reminds me of your typical mythical creature called the gargoyle. And the gargoyles have always been uh, guardians of some sort, and they were mythical creatures, and they had to have had their basis in some sort of fact uh, to be created. What was it? You know, more than a thousand years ago, they started out. I wonder if maybe the Mothman wasn't some sort of a throwback to some sort of a gargoyle. Yeah, I mean, you know, you can always kind of look at, as they say, everything has a, a grain of truth. And the gargoyles, you know, conceivably came not from complete imagination, but perhaps from something that one of those first artisans or architects had seen that inspired that, you know, what we know as gargoyles. So, you know, it could be a similar or same phenomenon that was being seen there, you know, not necessarily the same interpretation of a gargoyle that's on a French building, but perhaps something that, yeah, very much strikes a resemblance to, to that. So, not to mention that other people have seen things occasionally that they report as being gargoyles. I, I see you know, published reports about people comparing what they saw to a gargoyle. So it's not a, completely unheard of for somebody to literally compare something they saw to a gargoyle. Yeah. Wow. That's exactly what it reminds me of. Every time I see the statue that they have in the town, my first reaction is that just looks like a gargoyle. And so if I were to see that thing flying around, that's exactly what I would be thinking of. <laughs> yeah, and certainly the statue. I mean, the statue is quite stylized and and everything, but, uh, but yeah, that, that it, it's very, I mean, it's just completely fascinating how that statue is there and I've never thought about it in those terms of how literally it's like a modern gargoyle statue in a small town in West Virginia but yes that's that's people saw some weird flying thing and then now there's a statue of 
that, that's a gargoyle. That, that's really cool. And it's a guardian. I, I think it wasn't necessarily a harbinger. I think it uh, it just kind of sensed that there was something off and happened to arrive. You know, it, a very uh, conspicuously on time. Uh, I don't think it necessarily maybe knew what was going on, but I think it, it had a tendency to sense it. I mean, you know, people and animals, we can sense when something might be getting ready to happen. I mean, a lot of animals know exactly when storms are going to happen or earthquakes, uh, that sort of thing. And then there are, uh, you know, people that can predict things that are going on just by their intuition and uh, messages that they get. So why not something like the moth? And who knows that maybe the that Bigfoot doesn't have almost the same feelings or the same way of being in the sense when somebody is in their area, not necessarily by sight or smell, but general overall animal intuition that there's something going on. And they either check it out or they avoid it. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's that's a good way to put it. Now, earlier uh, we were talking about the various different forms of communication, and um, brought up that some people feel weird in an area where they f- think that Bigfoot might be, whether it's uh, a you know, a feeling of dread or they're getting headaches or something like that. There have been a lot of case studies on animals who use different sound waves in order to communicate. And one of the ones that I noticed that they claim now that T-Rex had that our modern day Prolians have is that ability to give off that low drone vibration and we see it in the crocodiles especially when they're in the water because it bubbles up when they do it now we can barely it they can but we can feel it so I wonder if maybe the reason that people feel weird in the woods and get this almost nauseous feeling is because Bigfoot might be giving off uh, vocal waves or vibrations that we don't necessarily but we can feel and that might be a way of their communication yeah that's that's very very true and that that's why i think a lot of times we underestimate the capabilities of amazing animals you know we're quick to say oh well it, it must be supernatural but you know i know that uh you know, even some animals can hear really low frequencies, um, like dolphins and bats and things, have different sensory perceptions that that we don't. And it's, you know, extremely possible that something like Bigfoot could communicate with low frequencies and something that could affect us. We could feel it or sense it, but it could be something that they're using also to communicate with each other. Mm-hmm. And that we can't quite hear, but that we can certainly feel and it could give us a strange uh, unsettling, you know, reaction. So, yeah, I think that a lot of this stuff still falls into the realm of those amazing animals, if you will, Mm -hmm. uh, and things that, you know, we just don't yet understand and, you know, just so many possibilities. I got a question from the chat room from uh, Black Cat Sharon, and she wants to know, uh, what do these things eat? Does anyone know? Well, like everything, the best we can do is speculate. Yeah. But, you know, I would kind of say that, I mean, they're they're big. Bigfoots need a lot of calories, you know, sustenance. So they're going to probably be opportunistic feeders, omnivorous, you know, there's, depending on where they live, there's a variety of, 
of roots and plants and berries that they would enjoy. And, you know, there's been reports. I've had a hunter say he was sitting in a tree stand and watched a, a Bigfoot come in there and kill a wild hog. So, of course, there's plenty of hogs here in the south. Deer. I mean, many people believe that Bigfoot will kill a deer, and there's been some bizarre carcasses of deer found. So I think certainly deer would be a good food source. You know, you know, whatever else they're willing to eat, frogs and I suppose insects and, you know, just about anything. So th- I think there's no lack of food out there if you're willing to... <laughs> to hunt for it and to eat it. Now, do you think um, any of these uh, different sightings uh, could be associated with aliens? Well, I don't see a great correlation between aliens and Bigfoot. That being said, there are a few cases where people report seeing unidentified balls of light or uh, UFO crafts, and then within the same night or proximity, somebody sees a Bigfoot. And I wrote a book called Momo, The Strange Case of the Missouri Monster, which was one such case that had all sorts of bizarre phenomenon going on, as well as this really kind of frightening Bigfoot creature that very credible witnesses had seen. But by by and large, however, you know, there's just not a big correlation because most Bigfoot sightings are simply somebody saw a big ape in the woods. No, no bizarre lights or phenomenon. And you know, you can look at literally, you know, thousands upon thousands of Bigfoot reports, and you're not going to see any anything having to do with aliens. Nor do I think there are pets of aliens being dropped off on Earth. That just, that's really stretching it, I think. And again, just comes back to, they look so much like the image of similar Earth dwellers, such as great apes, including us. They could very well, you know, have branched off of uh, a tree that's much closer to hominids. So... There, there's, they're just, they just seem to fit right into, you know, the earth, earthly uh, family of creatures. So I, I don't, I don't think they're aliens. That's just my opinion. Well, Lyle, uh, just hoping the audio keeps up. Um, is it possible Sasquatch and its ilk uh, may have been descended from uh, Gigantopithecus? That's a possibility. Gigantopithecus was a huge ape that lived in Asia perhaps 13,000 years ago. All we have right now for that particular species of animal is a jawbone and a bunch of teeth. So, you know, there's not a lot of stuff to work with. And because of the way the jawbone is shaped, Theories have come out that the Gigantopithecus walked upright, and if it did, it could have been up to like 13 feet tall. And if the creature had come across the Bering Land Bridge to North America when that was, you know, not underwater, then that might explain, you know, the presence of apes in North America. So it's a good theory, but again, it's it's a lot of speculation because we just don't have much in the way of fossils which also coincidentally answers the question of how come we don't have any bigfoot fossils well we know gigantopithecus lived and we have one jawbone and a bunch of teeth and that's just because we're lucky and they were found in a cave which preserved them so it's you know just because something was is here doesn't mean it's we're littering they're littering the earth with fossils that are easily found so um the i don't know if you've seen it or not the photograph from the dantaloff pass uh group oh yeah showed a photograph uh of what they believed might have been a bigfoot i don't know if you've seen that or not or whether or not you want to comment 
or whether or not a Bigfoot could have done uh, uh, all the damage. That 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 was a television show that co-opted a a photo that had nothing to do with those people. They didn't take that photo. Really? Okay. I believe from Ivan Marks that that is yeah that was just TV hullabaloo that that puts this together. It's unfortunate because some of those television shows are seen by so many people that it becomes now, you know, something that's widely thought of. Now, of course, that doesn't mean that people, there can't be a theory that maybe a, a Yeti or a, you know, the almost Russian Bigfoots didn't get them, but simply that that TV show made all that stuff up about the photo. That's incorrect or fake. Uh, but uh, I, I don't think that that was caused by Bigfoot. Uh, you know, from what I've read and seen, that it's very much you're talking about governments and military installations and things over there that people come to an untimely end if they get around those things or too close. Not to mention they're they're in a just an inhospitable environment to start with. That I I don't necessarily think that Bigfoot is the answer for what happened to them. It's yeah, certainly the brutality of the attack. Um, I certainly don't see that in anybody who says they come across a Bigfoot in the United States, at least. Yeah, it, it is. It's, it would be a you know a wild exception to the majority of the sightings that. You know, I think if those creatures were that aggressive or they're if where there's one, there could be others that we would have seen some massacres, you know, bef- that have come before and since that. And we just don't see that, you know, I mean, we just don't. Are you familiar with are there any First Nation uh, folklore of, of Bigfoot? Yes, there is. Many stories that uh, most of the tribes tell about some sort of what they would call hairy man or forest people or lost giants. You know, there's words that we've translated from Native American languages and extrapolated from their stories that we think, you know, they, they could very well be talking about a Bigfoot. And of course, when you get into Native American stories, it's often hard to tell what they consider a spirit animal or something that's ethereal and what's can, what is a actual terrestrial, you know, creature. Um, but, you know, there's enough there to suggest that certainly there's something to it. And there's some cave drawings of, of what's called hairy man and, those do very much resemble a Bigfoot. And those, you know, were long before anybody had ever coined the term or even Westerners had even been over here. So, um, and then if you talk to, you know, I, I live very close to Oklahoma where there's a, a lot of uh, tribal folks up there. And, you know, they will tell you that, oh, yeah, we know they're here. We're aware of them. We respect them. You know, they have a different view of, Bigfoot than Westerners do, and uh, so yeah, there, there's a support from Native Americans that suggest these creatures have been here all along. Wow! And then, of course, in Oklahoma right now, isn't there some county that has a Bigfoot hunt going on? Yeah, the the uh, Oklahoma in the last several years has really realized that Bigfoot is great for tourism. And (laughs) that is part of that. At first they came off, they kind of didn't word it right. Even though they said, we, we're not advocating a dead Bigfoot. We want proof of one, a a live subject, a live subject. You know, they had to come back and kind of correct that. Look, we say hunt, but we mean hunt for evidence. We don't mean, like, hunt one, please. Uh. And, uh, you know, part of that is good fun. I mean, Oklahoma is a place that most people don't 
you know, connect to Bigfoot, but there is some really, really good sightings that have occurred in the eastern portion of Oklahoma. And I mentioned earlier about the, the guys I knew that had been researching up there for years in the Washita Mountains. And, uh, you know, I've written in my book, Beyond Boggy Creek, I write a lot about some of the Oklahoma history. Uh, yeah, and it's a great place, but, you know, they've really had a lot of fun now with the Bigfoot. And so, you know, that's just kind of comes with the territory, but I always say, Hey, you know, it's better, more Bigfoot than less Bigfoot. So it's all. <laughs> yep, exactly. We've already killed off enough animals just in the last 50 years. Um, you know, so many of them are on the brink of extinction and everything because of uh, big game hunting and just plain sport or just encroachment on their territory. And, you know, it's a shame that maybe one of these days they will find the body of a Bigfoot, but by that time it'll be extinct because, you know, we've just taken over everything that they have. That's a shame. And I have a very light question. What is the plural of Bigfoot? I mean, it's <laughs> Bigfoot that... and Sasquatch, I cannot figure out what the plural of those are. Big feet. <laughs> <laughs> that is that is a debate not unlike whether a bigfoot exists it's you know the the chicken or the egg is it the big feet the big sass watch is it no one knows i see people going both ways i i don't know what do i i think i try to in my books i just try to avoid using the plural just for that reason but uh, I think it's Bigfoots would be more <laughs> accurate, or Sasquatches rather than the, than the Bigfoot. Awesome. I'll go with that. <laughs> but technically, I mean, if it has one big foot, then it needs, then the other foot is big, so it, it does have big feet. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Our dime is running right on down. Uh, I got time for probably. One more quick question from somebody. Is there anybody in the chat room that had one, or one that you guys got? It's Big Foote. <laughs> um, Lyle, is there any one uh, particular place here in, well, anywhere in the world that you haven't been so far to search for Bigfoot that you would really like to go to? Well, you know, I haven't really been up much in the Pacific Northwest area. And I've, I've been up there some few times over the years, but I've really never been able to thoroughly, you know, take some time and go into the heart of, you know, the original Bigfoot country. So that that's something that would be great to do, and hopefully I'll get some time to do it. I guess there's always so much going on that, you know, that's – and then people have covered that area quite extensively, but – yeah, I would like to go into the Pacific Northwest for an extended amount of time if I can. I wish you luck on it. Mount Shasta, there's a lot of caverns in there. <laughs> yeah, it's, and it's beautiful up there. You know, I, I, anytime I've been up to that Washington State areas, it's just a great, I don't know, it's just, just very scenic and peaceful in, in many ways. So that would it would just be, whether I saw a Bigfoot or not, it would still be a really great trip. Wow. All right. Our time is uh, dwindling right on down. I want you to take and give out your sites and how people can follow you and, and all the good stuff. And then uh, stay on till after we're off and, and then we'll thank you. All right. So if you want to find out more about um, my books and the films I've been involved in, just visit lyleblackburn.com, and that has links to all the appropriate destinations. My, my books are available at my online store, and they're also available on Amazon in ebook, paperback, and some of them in hardback, and one of them now in audiobooks. So... Uh, if you would like to see the other Small Town Monsters movies, you can search the Amazon Prime video. Just search for Lyle Blackburn, and all those will come up. Um, and 
yeah, so you know, thanks for having me on. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. No problem. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you, guys. Now, uh, Tabby, why don't you let everybody know who are or Jeff? Do you, which one of you guys has that info for, for next week? Tabby. Okay. Tabby. Tabby. Okay. Yes. Uh, next week uh, we will be chatting with author paranormal researcher and paranormal investigator Rich Newman about all of his uh, really interesting experiences in the ghostly realm. So tune in. All right. Uh, I guess it's pretty much. uh, Barbara, do you have anything to add for anything? Uh, But no, but please check um, Lyle's site. Uh, It's absolutely wonderful. Also check out his videos because he also writes and produces uh, documentaries. So please check them out. Definitely. All right. And thank you. Yes. Yes. So uh, with that, I think it's time for us to run. And uh, as soon as I get my thing brought up here, we can start doing that. But... Okay, so until then, uh, this is Henry Foister, Jeffrey Gould, Barbara Duncan, Cat Cash, and we will see you next week at the same time. So, good night, everybody. You've been listening. To the Paranormal View on the Para-X Radio Network. Join us again next week at the same time for more of the Paranormal View.